The Aeneid by Publius Virgilius Mero. You'll notice that uh, his middle name is how we remember the author of the Aeneid, uh, Virgil. And you also notice that it's spelled with an E in Latin. Uh, sometimes, depending on the translation or the edition you get, it may be uh, that Virgil is spelled V-E-R-G-I-L, or it may be spelled V-I-R-G-I-L according to our modern anglicized uh, spelling of that name. Virgil lived between 70 and 19 BCE. This is uh, during the uh, transition of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. The, you know, during the time of uh, Julius Caesar and more importantly his nephew Octavian who would later become known as Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. Uh, because this time period was highly influential, if you've already read books one through six of the Aeneid, you realize that there's a lot of Roman history that gets added in, whether it's the prophecies made by Jupiter to Venus in book one or the prophecy made by Anchises in the underworld as he reviews all the, the souls of the future Romans in book six, you see that Virgil has a lot of Roman history in uh, a narrative that tells a story about things that happened centuries before uh, Rome ever existed. So Virgil's time period and historical context are gonna be uh, very important. They're always gonna be important to any text we read, but in this case, you see this sort of deliberate uh, inclusion of later history, anachronistic history, into a story. So to put this in our contextual timeline, uh, remember that the Trojan War, if there was a historical Trojan War, there were a series of events around the city of Ilius or uh, Wilusa, this uh, uh, Hittite, uh, western Hittite uh, city. Uh, that was destroyed by an earthquake around 1250, and it was destroyed by uh, invasion around 1180, 1175. So somewhere between 1250 and 1175, uh, we have what could have been a historical Trojan War. So this would have been the time, and this was the time that later, fifth century Greeks attributed uh, the Trojan War. So the historical events would have taken place around this time. And anything we know about the figures that fought this war uh, comes from the writings of Homer or the, the, the poetry that gets redacted into the Iliad and the Odyssey written sometime during the 8th or 7th century BCE. So sometime between 750 and 600 is when we have the works of the Iliad and the Odyssey put together. That means that seven centuries have passed between the time Homer writes the Iliad and the Odyssey and the time Virgil writes the Aeneid. Uh, he's writing this between 29 BCE and up to his death in 19 BCE. And so between these two time periods, a lot has happened. In these seven centuries, it's not just a span of time that has passed, but the entire empire of Rome has uh, emerged and sort of risen to power in that intervening time period. So right about the same time that Homer is writing or redacting or compiling the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, according to legend, this is the time when uh, the city of Rome was actually founded. And that city will exist uh, as a kingdom up until about 509, when through a series of abuses of power by the, the kings at the time, uh, and a reaction against that abuse of power, uh, the kings will be killed off and they'll be replaced by the senate and, and consuls in a sort of a limited, more democratic form of uh, government not entirely democratic in the modern sense, and not even democratic in the sense that the Greek city-states were democratic, but something more democratic. Uh, there was this, uh, the Roman Republic emerges as a reaction against the abuses of tyrannical kings. And it will continue to grow in influence, and then around 260, between 264 and 146 BCE, uh, they will come into conflict with the city of Carthage on the opposite side of the Mediterranean. Uh, on, the south, uh, on the southern coast of the Mediterranean, the northern end of Africa. And during these wars, Rome and Carthage will compete for control of the Mediterranean, and ultimately Rome will be victorious. And about the same time, Rome will defeat Carthage and the Greek city-states that are under the control of the Macedonian kings, that is the descendants of Alexander the Great. And at, in, at that time, in 146, Rome will come to control pretty much the entire Mediterranean. The, L, the areas of Roman history we're probably most familiar with is the time of Julius Caesar, uh, who around 49 BCE crosses the Rubicon River uh, with his army, and this is something that 
military generals were not allowed to do. They were not allowed to bring their, their military too close to the city of Rome because there was a fear of a military coup. And that's exactly what Caesar uh, seems to have been uh, thinking. He, he leads his entire, uh, leads his legions across the Rubicon River into Rome so that he can take sole power. And because of this transgression, because of the, the threat of uh, a military dictatorship that he poses, in 44 BCE he's assassinated. Uh, although that assassination does not have the desired effect, it does not return Rome to a republic ruled over by the Senate. Uh, in fact, through sev after several civil wars, his nephew Octavian will defeat his rivals to become the first uh, emperor of Rome, the first uh, sole ruler uh, who exercises individual control over the entire Roman Empire. And it's during Octavian's reign, or Octavian after he takes the name of Augustus Caesar, it's during this time period that Virgil is composing the Aeneid. And so to understand a lot of the elements that are new in Virgil that were not in Homer or any of the other uh, accounts we've read, or any of the other versions of the Trojan War, to understand that we have to understand the history, uh, the anachronistic history, what happens after the Trojan War and after Homer and yet is relevant to the narrative that Virgil wants to communicate. So, as I said, according to legend, around the year 753 BCE, uh, Rome, Roman legend tells us that the city itself was founded by two brothers named Romulus and Remus. Uh, they were the sons of Mars, who the Roman name for the Greek god Ares, and the uh, human uh, queen, Aurea Silvia, uh, or she was a Latin princess of Alba Longa. Alba Longa is the city that's eventually going to be founded by Iulus or Ascanius, if you read the, the second half of the Aeneid. But uh, it, it's important to recognize that at the end of the Aeneid, Rome has still not been founded. It won't be, a found, won't be founded for several more centuries. But the city of Alba Longa uh, exists, and Aeneas' line is going to be, come to rule over that city. And their descendant is going to be uh, Aeneas' and, and Anchises' and uh, Ascanius' descendant, Rhea Silvia, uh, is, will be, uh, is, according to legend, raped by the god Mars, and she gives birth to these uh, two twin brothers. And her uncle tries to take over the kingdom uh, of Alba Longa, and in order to do so, he has to get rid of these two boys, these two babies. And so he instructs that they be uh, removed, that they be uh, uh, executed. But instead of being executed, they're taken to the river bank, uh, the bank of the river Tiber, uh, in the, the site of what eventually will become the city of Rome. And they're left there, and they're nursed, uh, according to the legend, they're nursed by this uh, wolf mother. And this is why uh, you frequently see on the standard or the coat of arms of the city of Rome, you'll see this image of these uh, two infants being nursed by uh, a mother wolf. And eventually they're taken in by a farmer. They grow up to uh, uh, retake the, the kingdom for their grandfather uh, and take over or return the, the rule of Alba Longa to their grandfather. But then they themselves want to set up a city of their own. So they go back to the place where they were abandoned on the riverbanks of the Tiber and decide to found a new city there. But they disagree about how and where to uh, found that city. And the disagreement escalates into a fight in which Romulus kills his brother Remus. And he names the city uh, Rome after himself. And, but then he has to get a population for that city. So he takes in um, fugitive criminals and runaway slaves and exiled foreigners, not the, the best people to found a city, uh, to be the initial population of a city, perhaps. And the fact that these were all vagabonds, these were all runaways and, and fugitives, uh, means that they were primarily male. So they have to, if they're going to have a sustainable population, they need females too. So they try to make proposals with people in nearby cities to arrange weddings between the, the first generation of Romans and the daughters of these nearby cities. But obviously, if you have a population of mostly escaped criminals, then uh, that's, probably not going to be uh, very marriageable material, so uh, they can't get these marriages arranged, so they fake a festival, a religious festival, and they invite uh, the, the citizens of nearby cities to this festival, and at, uh, at a prearranged signal, the, the Roman men uh, come out and attack the 
people who were there for this festival, they take away all the single women of marriageable age and keep them as basically prisoners and wives. So the first generation of Roman men are criminals and runaway slaves, uh, and the first generation of Roman women are the uh, these captured, uh, abducted women. And this, freak, this event is frequently referred to as the rape of the Sabine women, the Sabine uh, provinces being the, the, the areas around uh, the, the city of Rome or nearby the city of Rome. So this origin story, before Virgil comes along and develops the, uh, the Aeneid, the story of Aeneas as a, a founding epic or even a founding myth, uh, the founding myth of Rome was this, this not a very, edifying legend uh, to ground the identity of a population that's going to try to expand across the, the known world and supposedly bring justice and, and peace and, and all of this. You need, uh, you can see that this founding legend probably would not lend itself to the sort of noble ideals that, lo that Rome would later aspire to. However Rome was founded, uh, the historical landscape uh, that we're looking at at this time, be between the eighth and the sixth centuries BCE. So, uh, you know, if this was 573 uh, BCE, the the historical world around Rome at the time looked something like this. On this map, you see uh, in red these individual colonies, uh, almost all coastal colonies, are Greek colonies. So the Greek civilization, even before the Golden Age of Greece, before the the fifth century uh, time. Greece had expanded across the Mediterranean and the Black Sea and established trading port cities and uh, colonies uh, across the northern Mediterranean as well as the Black Sea. Now the yellow colonies you see, these are Carthaginian or uh, Phoenician cities. Now I should make the distinction now but it's going to be very important when we talk about Dido. Uh, Phoenicia is this area on the Mediterranean coast, on the very eastern end of the Mediterranean, north of uh, uh, Judah and Israel, uh, the, the modern nations of Lebanon and Syria. Uh, these cities, like the city of Byblos, which you'll remember from uh, discussing uh, the, the Bible, this is where the word Bible comes from because this is where books came from, uh, this city of Byblos. Uh, Tyre and Sidon are mentioned in the Bible as well. Uh, but this city of Tyre especially is where uh, Dido is coming from. But it's also where this uh, maritime culture, uh, these uh, sailors who were able to trade across the Mediterranean in a geographic area that's even more expansive than that uh, of the Greeks, uh, they are the sort of uh, competitors w with the Greeks. Not necessarily militarily, uh, although there will be occasional fights over individual uh, ports. but when it comes to trade, they have their areas and the Greeks have their areas. But notice that the Romans, Rome isn't even a power yet, and these gray uh, cities in northern Italy that you see, uh, these are Latin or Etruscan or other uh, native uh, Italian groups, but even on the peninsula of Italy, there are way more Greek port cities than there are uh, cities run by the, the native population. And so it's at this time that Rome is founded, when the Mediterranean is pretty well divided up between Phoenician and Greek colonies. But that's going to change as Rome starts to expand across the Italian peninsula, uh, starts to fight with the, the Greeks over Greek colonies that are located there. And uh, by, the, by the year 264, Rome has taken over uh, the Italian peninsula as well as the island of Sicily and Corsica and Sardinia. And this means that not only are they in consistent conflict with the Greeks, who by this time are uh, controlled by the, the Macedonians, that is the descendants of Alexander the Great, but also it's gonna bring them into conflict with the Phoenicians, uh, specifically the Phoenicians that have set up a primary city at, at Carthage on the, uh, the North African coast. And it's at this time that the Romans are gonna come into conflict with the uh, Carthaginian general Hannibal or Hannibal Barca, uh, during these three wars, which are described as the Punic Wars. The word Punic comes from Punios, which is a Latin version of Phoenician. Uh, so you can see as the word Phoenician gets repeated from uh, actual the ph actual Phoenician language to Greek, and then from Greek to Latin, uh, Phoenician becomes Punic. So even when they're in this uh, war with Carthage, they're describing them as the Phoenicians. So 
the, Rome, the Romans come into conflict with the Carthaginians, and this Carthaginian general Hannibal is the one who is most famous for uh, leading uh, his army across the Straits of Gibraltar and marching up through Spain uh, in modern day France, then over the Alps and down into Italy. Uh, he had famously these war elephants with him, although they didn't do very well on the uh, crossing the Pyrenees and, and the Alps and didn't, uh, didn't survive to really take part in much conflict on the Italian peninsula. But Hannibal was able to ride across the Italian peninsula uh, causing massive defeats for the Romans. Most famously at the Battle of Cannae, the Carthaginians under Hannibal defeated and killed an army of about 30,000 Romans. And the way they did this was this sort of pincher movement where they surrounded the Romans who were marching straight forward in, in phalanx positions. By uh, taking both of their flanks, they were able to sort of close in and sort of crush the Romans uh, in this battlefield press. Uh, and this is the, the basis if you've, uh, I believe it's season six or maybe five of the uh, show Game of Thrones when there's this battle between the Boltons and the uh, army of Jon Snow. Uh, this, uh, the screenwriters uh, in interviews, the screenwriters say they directly modeled that battle on the Battle of Cannae uh, because this uh, sort of shield wall is built around the Romans and the, the Carthaginians with their shields just move closer and closer and closer, pack the Romans into where they can't move enough to fight. And through tactics like this, Hannibal shows that he has outmatched the, the Romans uh, on the battlefield. And so what happens is the Romans just basically lock themselves up in their cities, and Hannibal uh, is not prepared for, uh, to, to besiege a city. So he can't take a city by siege. He can defeat anybody on the battlefield, but the Romans basically just lock their doors and say, okay, fine, uh, you know, right around the, uh, the, the peninsula, but there's really nothing more Hannibal can do. So eventually he, he's not able to take Rome or any other city. Uh, so he controls the, the field. The Romans are still well protected behind their walls. So they're at a stalemate and Hannibal is eventually recalled to Carthage. And it's only later that the Romans decide we can actually take the battle to him. We can first uh, challenge their supremacy in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, modern day Spain. Uh, where they're able to defeat him and his brother and then uh, they're able to move all the way back over to Carthage and completely destroy uh, the city of Carthage to the extent that they salt the fields where the Carthaginians can no longer grow uh, the, the food resources that they need. And at this time the Romans, by winning these Punic Wars, the Romans have basically annexed the other half of the Mediterranean. They now go from being uh, a local power on the Italian peninsula to becoming a world power as, as the, the world was then defined. And it's at the same time in the year 146 that they're able to defeat the Greeks as well because the Macedonian kings of Greece uh, allied themselves with Hannibal. Uh, the Romans were able to gather allies that wanted to fight against the Greeks and then in 146, at the same time they defeated the Carthaginians for control, they also defeated the Greeks to take over the uh, sort of maritime control of the Mediterranean. And for about a century, the Roman Republic uh, is able to prosper, it becomes more and more powerful, it builds up more and more client states, more colonies around the Mediterranean. And then with the uh, military exploits of Julius Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar, uh, the Romans are able to expand their empire into uh, reaches of Northern and Western Europe. And because Caesar has so many victories on the battlefield in Gaul, modern day uh, France and uh, other areas of Western Europe, uh, he becomes extremely influential uh, within the city of Rome itself, but also especially with the legions that he's, is, he is commanding. And so when he leads these legions back into Rome, it's uh, very quickly seen, probably more or less accurately, as an attempt at a military coup, where he is now, you know, if he has soldiers that are more loyal to him than they are to the Senate and people of Rome, uh, then he is positioned to become a military dictator. And this is the very thing that leads to his assassination. Some people, uh, even his uh, friends and allies, see what a threat he is to the Roman uh, way of life, to the Roman Republic, and uh, he's assassinated. Uh, on the Ides of March, March 15th and 44 BCE. But his assassination does not have the 
outcome of uh, protecting the Republic, you know, the, the rule by the Senate uh, that uh, the, his assassins had hoped that it would. In fact, uh, the people who carried out that assassination were hunted down and uh, defeated by uh, a combination of those loyal to Caesar, namely Marcus Antonius, who we remember as Mark Antony uh, from the Shakespeare play uh, Julius Caesar, uh, Mark Antony and Octavian, the nephew of Julius Caesar, who Caesar had chosen to be his heir. After Mark Antony and Octavian defeat the people that had been aligned against Julius Caesar, then they turn against each other. Uh, and this becomes extremely important for our perspective when reading Virgil, because with Mark Antony we have a Roman who allies himself with an African queen, that is Cleopatra, uh, who was a descendant of the Macedonian kings uh, because uh, Alexander the Great had conquered Egypt and he had left his, uh, one of his generals named Ptolemy in charge of Egypt and after he died Ptolemy's uh, uh, descendants uh, ruled over uh, northern Egypt. And Cleopatra was one of those uh, descendants. In fact, uh, her name is Greek. It means uh, the Kleos of the father. Uh, so it's a, it's a female name, but she is carrying on the Kleos, the glory of the, the Ptolemaic kings. But the fact that she is an African queen rather than a Roman uh, citizen, uh, this leads the people of Rome to be very suspicious of Mark Antony. They think this African queen is actually trying to take over Rome by uh, seducing Mark Antony. Uh, the way she had seduced, uh, allegedly seduced uh, Julius Caesar before that. And so she's perceived as a threat. And there's going to be some echo of her in Virgil's character of Dido. Uh, this implication that this African queen could um, jeopardize a Roman general's loyalty to uh, the Senate and the people of Rome. Uh, his loyalty to his uh, uh, patria, his, his fatherland. Octavian at this point is able to uh, muster an army. Uh, pursue Antony and Cleopatra to the city of Actium, which is in uh, Greece on the, the northern end of the Peloponnese. And at the Battle of Actium, Antony and Cleopatra are defeated, and at that point Octavian becomes the sole power in Rome. And he changes his name to Augustus Caesar. He, he takes on Julius Caesar's name, but he also takes it on not just as a name, but as a title. So it's very important to recognize here that Julius Caesar was never an emperor. Uh, he was a consul, he was a military dictator, but he never actually had this official title of, of emperor, imperator. Uh, but Augustus does, he becomes the first Roman emperor. And it's during the time of Augustus that Virgil is writing his Aeneid. And by the time that this happens, notice that Rome has taken over uh, all the, the yellow areas on this map are the Roman territories that uh, Rome had after they defeated uh, Carthage and Greece at the end of the Punic Wars, but when they defeat Cleopatra, they also take over the green area here, which was uh, controlled by the, the Ptolemaic kings of Greece. So they now have complete control of the Mediterranean, uh, with the small exception of a few areas in Thrace and, and southern Anatolia and, and Mauritania on the North African coast. They control nearly every coastline uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the world that Virgil lives in. This is nothing like the world that Aeneas, this is nothing like the, the Mediterranean world that Aeneas will cross, but Virgil cannot help but project his modern world back into this description of the, the founding of Rome. So when Virgil is writing his Aeneid, he is writing a story not just of what has happened in the distant past, in the time of Aeneas, but he's writing about Aeneas as bringing Troy to Rome uh, as a, a prelude, as a prologue to the reign of uh, Augustus Caesar or Octavian. So in this sense, uh, Virgil is writing not only a national epic, but he's writing an ideology. This is a story of the origin of Rome, even though, as I mentioned, uh, Aeneas is not ever gonna actually set foot in Rome. The, the city of Rome will not be founded until at least 753 but it's a, an origin story, and as an origin story, it consistently refers back to an anachronistic present, the, the time in which Virgil is actually writing, even though within the story itself, those uh, places and references would not be relevant. So as Aeneas flees Troy, uh, founds one city, and I'll talk about why there's 
Virgil has to include this uh, city of Aeneadae, or in your translation, Aeneas, uh, because that was a city that, according to legend, he had founded, but uh, Virgil doesn't want him to stop there. Virgil wants him to make his way all the way to Rome. And on that, on the way there, you'll see that there are a lot of connections with the Odyssey of Homer, uh, which I'll talk about in the next lecture. But also notice that there is this stopover at Actium, uh, even though this is more than a thousand years before the actual bat Battle of Actium, uh, Virgil calls attention to this place and, and shows that uh, the Trojans stopped there on their way to found Rome and perform sacrifices. And the implication is that later the Roman victory or the victory of Augustus at Actium has somehow benefited from this ancient uh, sacrifice that these Trojans made. So as we read the Aeneid, we have to keep a, dist a distinct eye on two things that are going on. Remember the difference between a narrative and a story. The narrative is what the author is describing, but the story is what's going on within that. The, uh, the thing being described is the story. And we can make a lot of inferences ourselves as readers about what is going on in the story, uh, because we can figure out, uh, we can use theory of mind to figure out what characters would be thinking, even if it's not that doesn't exactly uh, connect with what the author says they were thinking. Uh, you may notice a lot of uh, what we might call plot holes in, in modern uh, parlance. Uh, you may have wondered why does Aeneas, when he's escaping, when he's carrying his father on his shoulders to escape Troy, he's leading his son Ascanius by the hand, why does he tell his wife Creusa, just follow a little bit behind me? Uh, it seems that he's setting her up to get lost and, and end up dying in Troy, which is what happens. From the character's perspective, uh, as an audience, we're reconstructing the story and that doesn't seem to make much sense. That seems to be uh, complete disregard for his wife. He doesn't seem to be at all concerned about his, his wife's welfare. Uh, we're told that he is you know, distraught when he realizes he's left her behind, but we can't help but wonder why did you tell her to, to follow at a distance in the first place? Uh, well, we can see that within the narrative, if Virgil is trying to set up Aeneas as one of the ancestors of the Romans, he has to have her, uh, Aeneas arrive and marry someone else. He has to marry this uh, native uh, Latin queen. Well, he can't do that if he's still married to Creusa. And if we're going to have the story of Dido in book four, well, there's not going to be a story about Dido uh, and Aeneas falling in love if Aeneas arrives with his wife Creusa. So Virgil's goal is to get rid of Creusa in some way. And so the story as we reconstruct it is derived from the characters pursuing their own goals with their own particular strategies, uh, having their own individual feelings that we, the reader, can reconstruct based on what we're told in the narrative. But the narrative, what is what the author focuses on, what the author calls our attention to, and also what purposes and thoughts that the author ascribes to the characters, uh, that is, determined by the writer's goal, what the writer is trying to get us to uh, derive from this uh, description. So we can understand the motives of the characters without a lot of help from the narrator, but we also see Virgil trying to uh, shape uh, and direct our interpretations, our inferences, through the descriptions that he gives, through the narration. And so because he's writing this ideology of Rome, because this is his primary goal. His primary goal is not to tell us an interesting story about the aftermath of the Trojan War and about the adventures of Aeneas. His goal is to tell us where Rome came from and to connect Roman history with something more uh, noble, more uh, honorable than the story of Romulus and Remus, These uh, this brother who murders his brother, founds a city, with criminals and these criminals build families by kidnapping women from uh, neighboring cities. Uh, Virgil wants to push past that and connect Rome's origin with the, the Trojan War with Aeneas, with these very respectable characters that we know from Homer. So the way he's going to, to tell this story is going to be determined by that goal more than just conveying information for its own sake, or conveying a narrative for its own sake.